Hey YouTube, welcome back to another History Teacher Reacts video with Mr. Terry as I continue my search for historical knowledge here on the internet. All right, we are headed back to the uh, Extra History series on the Inca Empire, and we're looking at episode two today, which is titled Earth Shaker. So the first episode kind of introduced the background of the region, um, and then up to basically up to the founding of the Inca Empire. So they kind of ended with introducing uh, Pachacuti, who's kind of seen as the, basically the founder of the Inca Empire. So we get to really see the empire, you know, as an empire, I think, right now. All right, well, the original video link is down below. Make sure that you check that out and uh, click on it and give it the view time, subscription, extra history is awesome. And hopefully you're gonna enjoy this series. Uh, if you didn't see episode one, make sure you see that, and then come on back and then look out for the future episodes because this is a five-part series. All right, let's go ahead and get started. The emperor, called Sapa Inca, son of the sun god Inti, has returned to the capital, but he is afraid. Waiting oh. for him is his son, Inca Yupanqui. Oh, no. Twenty years before, an army had marched on Cusco, and in response, the emperor fled to a mountain fortress with his chosen heir. But the emperor also left Yupanqui, his third son, to hopelessly defend the city. Yet the sun god saw Yupanqui's bravery and intervened. It was said that even the stones themselves rose up to fight on the prince's yeah. behalf. Seems but legit. The enemy routed. The emperor did not return, afraid of his son's new power. So for mm. 20 years, you <laughs> You'd only do that if you're afraid of your son, like actually afraid of your son. Like, what are you afraid he's going to do when you get back? Like, just not accept you back? That's probably, I mean, that, that seems like the only reason you do that. He rebuilt Cusco in the emperor's absence as his father sent assassins to kill his usurping child. Gee, okay, now, there you the go. the emperor has returned, and in doing so, he formally hands over his position to his son and grants him a new name, Pachacuti, the Earth Shaker. Yes, what a great name. The Earth Shaker, that's awesome. Love it. Pachacuti turned out to be a pretty good name for this ninth ruler of the Inca, because while the name did mean Earth Shaker, it was also a philosophical concept. Okay. In Quechua, the Inca's primary language, a Pachacuti was a historic event, a cataclysm that overturned space and time, remaking the world. It was a good hmm. title for the man who had forged the kingdom of Cusco into an empire. Okay. Now, Cusco okay. was likely expansionist before Pachacuti, and they'd probably been laying the groundwork for empire building in the previous two centuries of the kingdom's ascendancy. Their agricultural terraces were productive enough to support large populations, and they had a system for freeze-drying potatoes and llama meat to make long-lasting military rations. In fact, the word jerky comes from the Quechua term for dried meat. Okay, how do they do that? How do they do that? Freeze-dried it? That's pretty awesome. By the way, this is where potatoes originated. Um, and uh, one of the most uh, um, important crops to ever develop in the Western Hemisphere has become staple food products um, all around the world. Um, later, when you get, you know, post columbian exchange. On top of all that, their system of roads and agricultural storehouses increased the range of their reach. And their labor system allowed them to call up large numbers of troops. Yeah, they they did that. Their their government structure was deep into all the villages across their their communities, um, and the government controls about everything. So being able to conscript would have been deeply in their culture because everybody has assigned jobs in the Inca culture, and um, has there's a there's a whole ladder of like accountability and and like. Um, um, supervision that happens where everybody's kind of has somebody that they are kind of in, uh, um, that's in charge of them. And there's, there's a big ladder going all the way back to the Inca emperor and then going down all the way into every household of the uh, Inca civilization. See, the Incan economy didn't use money or right. commerce of any kind. Yep. Instead, and no writing, remember. The state took its tax in labor. Yeah. During the agricultural off-season, peasants in Inca lands would right. be drafted for infrastructure construction building roads, yeah. temples, or agricultural terraces, or perhaps doing metalwork on gold or weapons if it was a local specialty. And in return, they would be issued anything they needed from government storehouses. But labor service could also... Now, 
Okay, they say open there. Um, the the main there there were main roads in the Ink Empire that actually regular people were not allowed to use. They were for official business only. So maybe some of the minor ones they had an extensive road system, but yeah, some of the uh, um, bigger ones and some of them were not allowed by regular citizens. Be issued anything they needed from. They're saying open for the storage house though. But labor yeah. service could also mean marshalling for war. When the Sapa Inca called up his army. The local chief or Inca representative would organize a labor draft. Then the people, few of them professional warriors, would show up armed in the traditional ethnic clothing and carrying whatever weapons they favored. Some of these far-ranging societies were slingers, others spearmen, some Amazonian archers with poison-tipped arrows, and others shock troops from the fiercest societies the Inca had conquered. Others still, the least military talented, essentially served as cannon fodder. And when Pachacuti took the throne of... Just Pluto, like throw him out there like hey just run out there <laughs> we, we got your back the first thing he did was put out the call to muster for war because not only did he need to solidify his power but he also dreamed of conquering all of the andes pachacuti's father had extended inca territory beyond cusco and that meant pachacuti was already one step ahead of the kingdom's rivals hmm. outside the walls of his capital there was no group large or cohesive enough to really rival him the Andes being nothing but warring ethnic groups, too splintered yeah. to resist a large power. In fact, they had never been unified um, to the scale that, of course, the Inca are going to. You're going to have civilizations that came before them, but nothing as large as that. So the whole unification thing was fairly unique. Local societies were so out. Stepped on babies. By Cusco that some historians argue that Pachacuti's miraculous defense might be a myth, oh, invented or Captain heavily Inca. embellished. In to legitimize his coup of course in this climate of of course powers and small Classic. groups even cusco's modest territorial holdings just a few population centers dominated proved impossible to resist whether diplomatically or militarily pachacuti drove south taking mountain forts and wrestling control away from local tribes and he took their leaders back to cusco where he would lay them down in a line and walk on their heads to show dominance before beheading them whoa Ooh, dominance combo why kill them then <laughs> if you want to show dominance? You think you'd, you'd want to show dominance so then after that they you have them basically wrapped around your finger, not squashed under your foot. Um, but that that's a big flex right there. Holy cow, I'd never heard of that. Some he flayed, stuffing their empty skins with ashes. And with each conquered territory, he gained more laborers for his roads and more soldiers for his armies. But he didn't fight everyone. Indeed, if he had... His conquests would have never happened so quickly. For the Inca, military force was a last resort. And initially, they would send ambassadors with gifts and offers of marriage, essentially promising that, apart from the labor tax, nothing would change in local government, culture, or society. In return, the society would get access to Inca roads and storehouses. Okay. Oh, and as an added bonus, they wouldn't be destroyed. Hooray! Yeah. If That's the only bonus failed, that, however, that you would need. Then the Inca would threaten military force. And considering they could field armies of over 100,000 warriors, this was often pretty persuasive, Whew. especially when they used the mountainous terrain to appear without warning. Yeah, you, 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 you don't get an empire as big as the Inca Empire without some force diplomacy. Just pure conquest is, I mean, yeah, you can destroy stuff. You're not going to have anything to rule, but not at the scale that these would happen. Even the Mongol Empire, who's one of the greatest conquerors ever, had plenty of places that were just forced into diplomacy because they understood the alternative was utter destruction. Um, so having that kind of thing uh, at your disposal to be able to have that kind of fear is, it looks like a commonality amongst all major world empires in history. Many a local noble, brave in his stone palace, would quickly capitulate once he saw an Inca army suddenly appear outside his walls, banging drums stretched with the skin of defeated enemies and playing flutes made from human bone Ooh. only in a minority of cases did the inca have to actually fight when he reached yeah. modern day bolivia pachacuti deemed it far enough and returned to the capital but for his that's honestly military, when you know you have a good military your military is so good that people don't even want to attempt to fight you next expedition he sent his brother north into the andes in a bid to conquer all the way to the coast this move gave the burgeoning inca state access to the sea and solidified the transformation of Inca power. Pachacuti no longer ruled a kingdom. The Earthshaker now had his empire. Right. But... Diversity of subject peoples? For a ruler. 
good rulers delegate, but that sometimes meant you delegate away your glory. True. And that was especially not ideal in a state like the Incas, where there was no specific grounds for succession, and primogeniture didn't hold sway. But you have to. They're too big. It, the empire's way too big. I mean, you've seen the geographic challenges that come with the Inca Empire. You can't just completely um, legislate from one one source. You're going to have to delegate. You're going to have to have a whole system of a bureaucracy. Now, of course, as a leader, what you're going to have to do is make sure you have trusted people. But something, again, this size, that's what all the major empires do. You, you become very bureaucratic and you have intendants and, and people that carry out your wishes. But again, it can be hard, especially if because um, those positions can also be very corrupted. And uh, it's a challenge, no doubt, though. Theoretically, any male relative could succeed Pachacuti. A son, an uncle or a brother maybe one who'd gain which means a reputation as a conqueror more competition so on the northern expedition's glorious return to cusco pachacuti charged his brother and all the generals with treason over a troop uprising and executed them there that fixed it this would actually one way to do matter. it <laughs> if you were a general in the inca empire you wanted to be successful sure just not too sure. successful. Yeah, because then because then you become a threat. We've seen that in history before, right? The biggest the people that you're most nervous of are the people that are obviously most successful because they can topple you. They can get more support than you. But then as a leader, it's like you obviously want successful people. You don't want to be hiring a bunch of failures. So where do you find that like that balance? Actually, if you were related to the Sapa Inca. Generals that won stunning victories almost always got beheaded upon returning to Cusco <laughs> because the Sapa Inca. So who would want to be a general? The sun. Why would you want and to be a general? You do not outshine the sun. Pachacuti learned a valuable lesson. If you're going to delegate to someone, make sure you're comfortable with them getting the credit. So as a result, he sent his son and chosen heir, Tupa Inca Yupanqui, whose name, I kid you not, is sometimes pronounced Tupac, and I ain't mad at you. On a new I've heard of him. Northern expedition. Now, this was sort of a war internship, a way to help him gain experience while burnishing his ruler resume. Zoe, you got one of those, right? The gambit worked spectacularly. <laughs> Pachacuti could rule the center, while his son fought the brutal military campaigns on the coast in modern Ecuador and head the first forays east into the Amazon. These grinding campaigns sharpened Tupa Inca into a fierce, ruthless warrior. One willing to dam a settlement's water supply to force surrender. One way to do also it. Learned how to I mean, that's that's a common war tactic throughout history is you cut them off from their supplies, come off of their trade routes, come um, throw them their farms, because usually farms are outside the city centers, and you pretty much just starve them out. Maximize his military force, rotating his Andean troops back into the mountains periodically so they could recover from the unfamiliar coastal and jungle environments. Still, the Inca had difficulty pushing into the hostile jungles of the Amazon, an effort Tupa Inca eventually had to abandon in order to crush a rebellion. With his son in the field, Pachacuti could manage the empire's building program, personally sculpting a model of his new capital from clay. But why is he and not? He continued improving. Why is he not nervous of Tupac? He was nervous of all the other family members, just because he was gone away. Was he planning on killing him when he gets back, just like he did with the other generals? All right, building up Minecraft style here. Build up your capital. Let's go. Augmenting it to carry water to the city through underground channels. Cool. He raised forts in the hills and built lavish royal residences, supposedly including Machu Picchu. Though, granted, that is heavily disputed. Yeah, but they don't know a lot about the history of Machu Picchu. But anyway, look if look at the uh, engineering of the Inca like foundations and stuff that we do have that survive. It is amazing the like perfect stone cutting when you see the seams of their stones. They're like just perfectly seamless. It's it's like remarkable, um, and unlike places that we see, uh, you know, elsewhere in the world. And again, you're dealing with a, a group of people that didn't have metallurgy, um, you know, metal tools and stuff. So it's like it's blown people's minds when you get the alien conspiracists and stuff. Is the the again the type of technical accuracy and technical like perfection of how they were able to stack uh, bricks with with just seamless seams is amazing. Check it out. He did erect palaces, hospitals, and temples while laying roads to his new conquests. But Pachacuti's greatest work was to rebuild the Golden Courtyard, a temple dedicated to the sun god Inti. Inti. In Inca religion, gold was considered the sweat of the sun, 
and silver the tears of the moon. That's so cool. He covered the walls That's cool. of the courtyard sun chamber with gold and Ooh. the walls of the moon chamber with silver. Emeralds and turquoise dotted the sheets of precious metal. And on the solstice, he I bet the Spanish would like this if they could find it. Would enter the sun chamber and catch the dawn rays in a concave mirror, using it to light a fire. Seven previous Inca rulers, mummified in a high altitude freeze. Yeah, they did mummification. Sat on a golden bench watching the ritual. Waiting. A lot of people don't know how many cultures actually mummify people. We see it on every continent. Mummification is just it's way more common than just Egyptians, like a lot of people think. It was done and done earlier than the Egyptians ever did in other places. We see thou multi multiple thousands of years old of um, mummies in the Americas. To be consulted on matters of state. And it may have been here where Pachacuti wrote a group of sacred hymns still with us today. But Pachacuti's okay. engineering also had a dark side because he also decided to engineer the empire's population. He forcibly moved whole ethnic groups to agricultural land he deemed more productive, mm. displacing entire societies in order to better stock the empire's storehouses and arm its troops. Hundreds of thousands, some say millions of people from the lowest rung of Inca society were forced to resettle in far-flung corners of the burgeoning empire. This sounds like it could be a disaster that is going to be, people are going to rebel against this, you know, treating people this way. I mean, he definitely seems somebody that's very confident in his ways and uses force to do that. But this kind of thing, displacement, you know, ethnic displacement is just something um, that can't go well. And when Pachacuti died, his organs removed and his body freeze-dried in the wept. alien cold, <laughs> his son Tupa Inca Yupanqui rested him on a golden bench alongside his ancestors and kept conquering. Nice. Though Tupa Inca would die young, this father-son team hmm. were responsible for the largest territorial expansion in Inca history. And while later emperors would put down rebellions no. and nibble at the edges of nearby territories, never again would the Inca experience such explosive growth. So with all that said, what was this empire they built actually like? Well, join us next time for a day in the life of several members of Inca society, from agricultural workers to the surprising social life of a dead Inca emperor. Mm -hmm. And just a hint, it totally involves mummy parties. Yeah. Man, history is metal. Special thanks to... So I've heard of that. This They, they, would, um, they would bring, like, mummified like former kings and, and chiefs and stuff, they would mummify them. And then like, they would bring them out to battles and stuff like that. And it's like, he was, it's like he was, these, these leaders are still leaders even after death. And they would have these, I uh, heard they would have these wars and stuff, these battles again, where they would bring them out. And it was almost like the object sometimes of the battle would be to try to take the enemy's mummified leader, like a capture the flag, but with, dead mummies <laughs> you know dead leaders as mummies all right let's talk more about this all right so definitely learned a ton there um i learned way more about pachacuti and kind of his ruthlessness uh, you know my my knowledge had previously just been mostly about you know he he unified the empire and uh, it's kind of their first emperor but didn't know much of him as a ruler and yeah i saw a little bit more about things i knew about how the inca ruled but you know him coming into to, to doing that with the forced conscription forced migration um, the paranoia, obviously, he had with people that were also, you know, like powerful people that he could fear to be able to usurp the throne. Um, and, but yeah, I did not know nearly as much about his brutality. Um, cool to learn more about Tupac. And even though it looked like he had a, a pretty short stint as an actual ruler, but awesome to see that. And now I'm interested to see, yeah, now more about, um, Inca culture. Right now you have this empire. What's this Inca culture going to be like? And I think this will be very useful. I think this is great for like in a classroom to teach about some of these unique things. These are great attention getters in a classroom where you talk about, oh, yeah, so Pachacuti, he was the founder of the emperor, empire. Oh, and did you know that he would, you know, step on their faces and cut their heads off of, you know, people that he wanted to uh, 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 just, I don't know, flex over? Those are great attention getters that are always fun to get and to, to talk about in the classroom. All right. Well, definitely um, stay tuned for episode three. So we'll get to that soon. 
and I uh, hope to see you come back more. Hopefully you're enjoying this and you're going to stick around for us. Original video link is down below as well. Some other links to some other things, um, discord server, my gaming channel on Twitch, gaming channel on YouTube. If you're into that, we got merch over on Teespring. There's a link down below. If you'd like to get some fun history merch and you can join our Patreon. This video series was chosen by our patrons. Is that something you'd like to do? There's a link to join our patron down below as well. All right. We'll see you next time. Bye.